Hey YouTube, you just clicked on part number four of uh, a Google Hangout that we had last week with Andy Jack, and uh, whenever you have a multi-part uh, Hangout or video, you see the views go down and down and down for each number. Um, so thank you for uh, clicking on this video and watching number four. What has happened here is uh, Andy Jack has left the Google Hangout. And Jason Peterson, Matthew 419, are joined by Jude 3 Defense. Uh, Tom is his name. His uh, YouTube channel is Jude 3 Defense. Check him out. And uh, Jude 3 uh, Defense joins to discuss uh, the topics that were covered during the, the Hangout with Andy Jack. Uh, Jason and Jude 3 Defense primarily interact, and then Matthew 419 also interjects i'm just kind of hanging out listening to the guys as they uh, reminisce about the conversation that we had with andy jack we make videos like this we continue hangouts not to talk behind andy's back or or uh talk bad about andy but to answer questions so that those who watched the video um and heard andy's concerns and uh, issues with christianity uh, so that all of us could hear the biblical uh, answer to each of his objections. And I hope, as does Jason, uh, Len, and Tom, we all hope that Andy watches this and that um, it sheds some light on uh, the concerns that he has um, and, you know, what, what true faith is and how one comes to know Christ as Savior. Lots and lots of topics are covered here. So, uh, take the time. It's over. It's about an hour long, as you know. Um, but please watch. Please watch and listen to um, three men who love Christ, who love you. Uh, take the time to um, discuss the issues and the hangout uh, from Andy Jack uh, on the Bible Thumping Wingnut Show. So enjoy. Well, my, my beef with, with his assertion of that was, first off, if a donkey talked, talk, there would not be any evidence of that in the future other than a historical account. But he already rejected that anyway. Um, but um, my, my thing is, is that it's such, a, it's such a juvenile objection to the Bible because, like you said, there's only two books where I actually talk. So I pointed out when I talked to him, I said, if you look at the whole length of the Bible, and you look at how many words in the Bible, very, you know, a very small portion of that is actually dedicated to miracles. Miracles did not happen. A lot of people think that, that in the, during the days of the Bible, miracles happened all the time. Fire always raised out of the sky, and that's just not the way it was. Um, yeah. you, miracles were unusual. That's why they sway, you know, and, and you can see too, even in Scripture where when someone sees a miracle, they still were not swayed. I mean, Peter walked on water with Jesus Christ right there, and he still had doubts. Right. Um, you oh, yeah. can't expect someone to come to Christ because of a miracle. It doesn't take that. It's it's a regeneration. It's God calling us to salvation. It you know. Um. But but it's just that the he just the reason why he stuck on that was because he wanted to try and set the burden of proof in a way to where he thought it would look like it was just he was justified in not being convinced. Right. And as I pointed right. out, his whole defense of his skepticism was nothing more than an argument from ignorance. And in case no one knows what an argument from ignorance is. An argument for ignorance is a, is a informal fallacy in logic that says that because you can't prove something to my satisfaction, therefore I'm justified in not believing it. On the flip side, you could also say just, be, just because you can't prove that something is not true to my satisfaction means that I am justified in, in, um, in uh, believing the contrary. So, um, And that's really what he was doing the whole time. Anytime we gave him evidence, he said that's not evidence, that's not enough proof. And it's nothing more than a fallacy of an argument from ignorance. So his entire defense of his skepticism was that was one fallacy, but there were more. But that was a big one he kept repeating over and over again, aside from category errors like science is truth. That's just ridiculous. You'll never find a science book that says that the supernatural isn't, isn't real or, that, um, or that, the, uh, that science is truth. I even asked him for sources of those definitions, and he didn't ever provide them. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um. I think a lot of people, they're under the false understanding that in biblical times, you know, it was 2,000 years ago, so far away, um, that there were no skeptics. No, 
Right. I think I think they were skeptics were just as prominent back then. Even the disciples were skeptics to some extent. Yeah. And they were with Jesus Christ. Uh, Second Peter talks about. Um, uh, well, I don't know the exact quote, but it says, "Well, we, we did not follow uh, cleverly devised myths." Uh, you familiar with that verse? Second Peter not, one, yeah. You, you mean the one that says not to buy into the vain philosophy and, and sound ar and um, not sound arguments, but but um, fine sounding arguments. Is that the one you're talking about? I can barely remember the part I was trying to quote, so I don't know if that's the same passage or somewhere different. Well, there is a passage that says that says, and I don't remember the exact verse right now, um, but there is a passage in Scripture that says to not be convinced by vain philosophies and fine sounding arguments. Um, that's the only one that comes to mind that's similar to what you're telling me. Mm -hmm. And even in that day, there were philosophic groups called skeptics. They even had oh, that absolutely. title. Oh, absolutely. Paul and the Yeah. Never and even even more so than the skeptics were cynics. Right. You know, they kind of had that. Um, you know, I, I think he, uh, Paul, you, uh, he went before the Areopagus, and he was mocked for having his miraculous claims of the resurrection. Right. Um, so, I don't know. Basically, the unbeliever who rejects Christianity on the basis of miracles is begging the question, because they'll have to admit that if the God of the Bible exists, miracles aren't the slightest difficulty for him to perform. Oh, absolutely. And I pointed out to him as well because he was making a metaphysical assumption. And what I mean when I say metaphysical, for those that don't know what it is, metaphysical, when you say metaphysics, that's about what is um, and what is there. So, like, metaphysics, like, is there really the super, is the supernatural really real? Well, mm -hmm. he, ha he made an assumption that was metaphysical, that there was no thing as such thing as supernatural. And I don't know if you watched this part of, of the discussion or not. But I told him before he's going in. I said, "Well, I said if you're going to give me, you're wanting me to give you evidence of Jesus Christ's resurrection, but you keep making this metaphysical assumption that there's no supernatural." And before I even started going into the twelve historical facts, which I only did seven of them because I didn't like he was really listening. Um, but um, I even before I went into the twelve historical facts, he flat out blurted that it was impossible for Jesus Christ to rise from the dead. And if someone's going to stay convinced that it's impossible, they're never going to be convinced that it's even possible because they already believe it's impossible in the first place. So, um, But he was making this metaphysical assumption of naturalism, and he was asking for empirical evidence for every claim, but whenever he made claims such as nature is all there is, um, such as God isn't real, the supernatural isn't real, he never gave any empirical evidence for that. And he also heavily relied on induction, and induction is a bottom-up sort of reasoning that's based off of probability. And um, and, if that, if, and if he's going to go off of that and say, well, I know the supernatural doesn't exist because i never seen it, well, that's an inductive argument. But you can't use induction as a foundation of, its reasoning, of, your, of your reasoning or your authority because induction cannot even justify itself. Your foundation for your, your um, knowledge and for your beliefs must be self-sufficient and self-attesting. And only the triune Christian God can meet that criteria. So, sorry, I went off on a tangent, but I just thought I'd go there. No, it's, it's an okay tangent. <laughs> I like that tangent. Yeah. I, I could say more, but I'll just... <laughs> I think I think even, a, even after, I mean, I, I kind of define myself in some ways as a skeptic. I'm naturally skeptic. In fact, I had a salesman come to my house trying to sell me some special uh, water purifier and he did this whole like chemistry experiment in my kitchen for like an hour mm. and he was trying to you know get me to sign up for some you know you gotta care for your kids welfare and you know they're drinking this stuff and blah 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 I'm like I, I have to research he's like what's the research He's like I don't trust you and he looked like he got offended I'm like you're a salesman I you automatically don't trust your you kitchen? I would never do that yeah I'm thinking <laughs> next time I'm gonna you know, not go that far, but anyway. Uh, so usually, Tom, the only time I let in the house is to share the gospel. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> old, old Tommy boy, and and uh, was a skeptic. You know, unless right. I see the the nail prints and put my hands in, I'm not gonna believe. Yeah, doubting Thomas. There's Jesus <clears throat> right there after he's died, and he wants some more evidence. I mean, um, of course, who who could even blame him? I mean, that's not something you see every day. Yeah, so you might as well just get all of it. Sure. And I don't even think that the Bible uh, was giving that narrative in a negative light, like, oh, this uh -oh, is what no, not to do. Not. Um, I think it makes a great point that even those that are right there with Jesus 
I mean, you can't, you just can't convince someone with miracles. And I know a lot of Word of Faith people believe that, but that you can't convince someone with a miracle. There has to be, there's more to it than just evidence when it comes to believing in God. There's, you know, whenever you make that that um that transition from um from an unbeliever or reprobate to a Christian, there's a lot more that goes on than just a conv being convinced of the evidence. For sure, and I, I you guys were talking a lot about faith. Um. Yeah, and, and and he made a statement that kind of struck me as, as funny, like why he, uh, you know, he says, "I wish I had the faith that you guys have," but yeah, he was disdaining faith the whole time. It well, he said he had faith in Plato. I mean, uh, in Platonic writings, I, I just <clears throat> I was floored that he would use faith as an objection to us, but then use it to support his belief in Plato. I mean, that's just that's just a, a double standard of of enormous proportions. I mean, I thought it was absurd, but but I, you know, and I. But I, you know, I try to be polite and just listen to him. But, but I was just thinking the whole time, like, man, I said, this is one of the strongest cases of skepticism I have ever seen. You know, and he can't even go out and live consistently with that kind of skepticism. And that's why I asked him. I said, Can you know, do you know that you woke up yesterday? Because it seems to me like he thought any belief in the past was utterly unjustifiable. And, um, and when, so even and if he were to convert to Christianity, if he kept that mindset, how would he know that he really converted to Christianity the previous day? It just all of it just doesn't make sense whenever you apply it to the way he would live his life. He just can't live consistently with the kind of things he's saying. He has to get up every the moment he gets up in the morning and start acting in, in ways that are contrary to those beliefs. He's already given up his worldview. He just doesn't know it. Right, and I, I would say this was, and not not to slam on him because there's there's just people who are in different areas, right? In the life, you know, so many factors that play in that you're just going to be low hanging fruit in one category or another. And this fella, and there's many on the both sides of the fence. There's many, you know, ignorant Christians to uh, philosophical matters, or even their own faith. And maybe that would, you know, be a question to whether or not they're Christians themselves. If you know, you, I wonder sometimes when I see people with gray hairs in the pews that hardly know much about their own faith. But um, and I know you guys aren't doing like a victory dance, like, hey, yeah, this guy, he was dumb. Well, uh, we we, we got know. him. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I, I, you didn't no, I, I'm just saying. Way. I'm just saying. In fairness, there are much smarter atheists out there to contend with. Absolutely. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think that for Christianity, the discussion went impeccably. Um, I feel like that both the um, you know Tim, Matthew, and I all cornered um, him multiple times. Um, so I think you know debate wise as far as the content and everything for Christianity versus atheism I think Christianity is com you know completely dominated tonight in that respect but I'm definitely you know he says prayer doesn't work but I'm gonna pray for him <laughs> yeah, I mean that's 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 what you have to do I mean it's it's hard to look at a guy like Andy and believe you know like there's hope you know like but you know then I look at myself five years ago, five and a half years ago, and I would have said, if I were talking to me six or seven years ago, I would have said, there is no hope for that guy. You know, it's all about the Lord. It's not about our arguments. It's not about, you know, anything that we can do or say to convince these people. It's all about the, um, the interceding power of the Holy Spirit moving and changing his heart. So, um, I mean, just look at Paul. You know, um, I don't know, man. It's 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 hard to. Well, that's a good point because Saul of Tarsus murdered Christians before he converted to Christianity. That's as you know, that's about as far from from uh, being a Christian as you can get is killing them. <laughs> so, so um, so yeah, that's what I think of when I hear people like um Andy Jones. You know, I just think of, of Saul, and I said, well, if Saul can become a Christian, then anybody can become a Christian, and I can't judge. Who's going to become a Christian and who's not? You know, I have to go in with the assumption that anybody I talk to could convert, and I want to do glory to God. I don't want, you know, I'm not, I'm not really about trying to convince some of the evidence so much as I'm about just doing what I am called to do, and that's something I keep in mind. So, you know, if if someone keeps interrupting me, and they won't let, and they won't let me, um, you know, share what I have to say, then I'm not going to. I'll be frustrated to some extent, but. You know, I'll just try and keep in mind that this isn't about me, and this isn't about me trying to beat them in the head with logic. You know, I could beat them in arguments all day, but but you can't beat, you cannot, um, 
have someone come to Christ just from being beaten up by a Christian in an argument. It's just, you know, and that's one thing I try and keep in mind whenever I'm talking to people like Andy. It's just, just that this is about God, not about me, not about my arguments, not about how smart I am. Um, but, you know, just about the glory of God. Right. So whether we're dealing with a very green atheist or a super sharp dude who can probably smoke us on the mats, we can still, bringing our uh, position, do glory to God either way. Right, yeah, and, God, and, and the Bible says the gospel won't return void. I mean, I, I just really believe, you know, I know this didn't go the way Tim wanted it to, but I firmly believe this one is exactly how God wanted it to. And I think we can, and, I, and Tim, I hope you can find comfortable comfort in that fact. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate yeah, that. There's yeah, different I, I personalities. Agree. Different personalities. I mean, I, like I said, I don't think you can be faulted in this one. Uh, you tried to intervene, and, and, you know, it didn't go on for too long. It only, what, hour and a half or so? I wanted to uh, say a little bit more about faith, um, because that was, like, the dominant theme in, like, the last half hour. Um, I say that... The fact, scripturally speaking, the Bible does denigrate faith at all. It actually exalts it, in fact. So, um, you know, and we have different definitions even within scripture. Like Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about the substance or evidence of things not seen. But I don't think faith can be limited to just what you can see. And obviously evidence is not limited to what you can see either. Um, but in a more simple way in which the atheist usually uses the term, Everyone has this sort of, you know, childish, I, I trust you, daddy, no matter what, because you said it, sort of faith. I mean, um, in a way, I would say, me and my wife are to my two-year-olds, uh, to, to her, we're like her whole world. We're basically God to her, you know. And I mean, that sounds a little blasphemous, but <laughs> you get my point. Um, and, and, you know, the Bible talks about becoming as such a one to enter the kingdom of heaven, you know, like a child. And so I, I, I think it might be a little faulty to just say, oh, it's all evidence-based. And, you know, obviously, uh, well, you brought up uh, a second ago about the, the conversion. That, that definitely is something we can't understand fully. But um, throw into the mix there that we're so very finite and skewed, you know, on those factors alone, I think we would have to make at least a measure of leaping trust in some basic epistemological precepts and other things that those precepts apply to. You, and you we are in, Go ahead. I was just going to say, you understand where I'm going with that? Yeah, I, I do hear you, Tom. And, um, you know, the Bible does say to walk by faith, not by sight. I mean, we have, I mean, here's the difference. I mean, if you look at an atheist, you know, and, and, um, and Lynn was talking... Um, to him and ask him how his reasoning could be valid, and which is, and he just, and he, you know, he turned a question back on. But in reality, though, when you ask an atheist how their reasoning can be valid, and they respond, they're using their reasoning. So if they use reasoning to justify their reasoning, then they are relying on it by blind faith. I mean, you just can't, especially on an empirical basis, it's true that your reasoning is valid. <clears throat> so by his own <coughs> logic, if he accepts empirical evidence, he cannot um, use it, use empirical evidence to justify his reasoning. So therefore. Um, you know, he shouldn't even trust his reasoning by his own standard of proof. And um, so then you would say pretty much all of it is, in a way, a. And I, I got to be careful, but in in light of how you just defined it and described it, blind mm -hmm. faith. Everybody exercises that blind faith. Right, and that's that's what he does. But here's a here's the difference, though. Um, if someone were to, ask, I mean, and I don't want to go into the topic of Christian epistemology because that's not what we're what we're talking about. I think I think we covered mm -hmm. that um, in his and Tom and Tim's show on presuppositional apologetics about a month or so back. Mm -hmm. But um, but when you look at it though, I mean, there's no there's no way to prove your reasoning at all. I mean, you just you you can't really ultimately prove that your reasoning is valid by using your reasoning. But the Christian faith is a little different. Because the Christian faith is inter is internally consistent, unlike the atheist um, concept, you know, the atheist blind faith of the reasoning. Um, you know, you can look at at what way uh, Andy Jones described his epistemology. He didn't, you know, he never could justify his reasoning, and he used his reasoning to answer for his reasoning. And like you pointed out, that is a notion of blind faith. Um, but with Christians, though, we have a bunch of uh, reasons 
to believe in in the in God. You know, we have evidence for it. But we also have this internal consistency in our area of knowledge. We have this Trinitarian God that is self-sufficient. We have a God that um, not only, um, in, a, in a moral aspect, He not only gave us these rules that some people find to be ridiculously high, you know, high um, standard and everything, and hard to follow. But He came down to Jesus Christ and followed His own rules. He suffered just like we did, um, and. I would say that in that aspect, in the moral aspect of all this, since God is all-knowing, um, and He is, and He was willing to go down and suffer <coughs> like we do for our sake, that shows a God um, that is self-sufficient. Not only can He tell us to do this, it's not like He's some immoral God and He's telling us to do this and this. He came down and played by His own rules and died for us. So that we could go to heaven. I mean, he went and he suffered under the very curse he placed on us. So in that aspect, he's self-sufficient. In the same way, in epistemology, which is the area of knowledge, which we were covering when we were asking how the reasoning, his reasoning was valid and everything, we have a God that that himself, he's both the essence of existence and a consciousness. Both of those things always existed through him, and he is a source of consciousness and existence. And he and he also um, him being three and one helps solve the problem of, of the one and many in philosophy. I mean his the his trinitarian aspect solves a, a lot of problems in philosophy. Um, and because of his self sufficiency, um, and I can say more on that, but just just to summarize, right, because of his self sufficiency, we can have a creature creator relationship with God that would allow us to know anything because God's omniscient. That means God knows reality as it is. He knows reality um, independent of our opinion, and because of that, we can, we can be justified in using him as a foundation of our knowledge due to his self-sufficiency. That's pretty much what I'm saying, but um, I wanted to answer that earlier when he was asking how we know things, but we didn't really have time to. So, <coughs> But, I mean, obviously, consistency is important. Absolutely. But I don't think that because it's consistent that it necessarily means it's true. With, in, in logic... Um, you can be, you know, ob abiding by all the the uh, basic rules and even more the peripheral uh, rules of logic and just be deemed logical in the end, but not necessarily have a uh, true uh, statement because you've not yet um, been able to demonstrate, or you know, it's just yet to be determined whether you've demonstrated your premises to be true. Well. So, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not. Basically, I think it's it's one of those areas where, because of the the uh, constant railing against this concept of faith (quotation marks), Christians have gotten afraid to say that they have this sort of faith where the feet doesn't touch the the bottom so to speak sure well and, we can't well we can't prove that um for instance um you know that god you know god tells us that we, he's going to keep his promise well you can't you can't prove that or disprove that logically so you have to accept it i agree with that um you, know, so you have to accept it on faith and that's what faith is is it's 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 faith that god will keep his promises it's the things that, as the bible says the things hoped for that are not seen but the way I was dealing with the logic, that was I was just saying that there are other reasons independent of our own faith that we could use to show that there are, there are good reasons to accept Christianity. And I would, you know, I would argue that there's no logic without God. But at the same time, if someone's, with, I have an atheist tell me before too the same thing you told me, Tom, and he said that well, just because something's largely consistent doesn't mean it's true. Well, if that's the case, then I suppose we have to throw all logic out of the window when no. trying to determine what's true and what's not true. So it's sort of a reductio ad absurdum. It would need to be logical and consistent for it to be true, but that alone wouldn't make it true. That's what I was saying. Well, God, God's nature, when you look at his nature, it rings with consistency. You can see consistency in his actions. You can see consistency in the way he loves, the way he expresses himself. And that's why you know, when, I go, when I approach world views, I look at them and I, and I try and show how – because you know, God is the only true God. If God's the only true God – Whenever we, um, whenever we express the knowledge of God, 
you know, because God is a log is a being that is logical. He invented logic as mm -hmm. a gift for us. Um, you know, um, James clearly says that all good things come from heaven above. Um, but I think though that we that based off of, of God's consistency, you know, the knowledge of God makes the wisdom of man look foolish. And when we show that consistency and that self sufficiency of God in the, in the foundation of worldview and how it all plays out and how it all makes sense. You know, I think that we're do, that we are fulfilling First Peter three fifteen, where it says to give an answer for the hope within us with meekness and fear. Yeah. Uh, do you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> I would just uh, throw in the mix of the uh, four checkpoints that Bonson talks about. Probably the preconditions of intelligibility would be the strongest angle. Right, um, and I and I I love Bonson and I love Van Teel. Um, <coughs> But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a pure. I guess you could say I'm not a pure presuppositionalist. I'm more of an MMA apologist. I use both classical and presuppositional arguments. That's the way I. That's the way I do it. But I do. I have read a lot of Botson and, and Van Til, and they have a lot of good stuff in there. I don't agree with them on everything, but I agree with them on most things. I don't think those terms are mutually exclusive. I think the waters have been muddied a bit on what it means to presuppose and use evidences anyway. So. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you know, like I don't think all presuppositionists have to necessarily only use a transcendental argument. There are other arguments that are presuppositional in nature that you could use. Um, but you know, um, and this is a little off topic, I guess. But when you look at William Lane Craig um, and his criticism of um, of presuppositional apologetics in the book Five Views on Apologetics, where he responds to John Frame and says that presuppositional apologetics is simply begging the question. Well, what's funny about that is that whenever he refers to the transcendental argument for God. <laughs> he objects it based off of servitude reasoning, but in his debate with Alex Rosenberg, he used the argument from intentionality, which had the exact same logical flow as the transcendental argument for God. Um, so I, I found that to be a little funny. I don't know if he realized that or not, but I think that part of his objection to presuppositional <coughs> apologetics as Van Til and Greg Boston presents it is based off of, of some sort of misunderstanding that, that I have not been able to identify yet. But yeah, mm -hmm. I agree with you. There are some confu There is some confusion over what presuppositional apologetics are. Um, and I try not to label myself as either a presuppositional or a classicalist because um, when I when I say things like that, people have different conceptions of what they are. So I just kind of I just kind of do it, you know, the way that I I best believe, you know, glorifies God. So that <coughs> that guy when uh, I had one other uh, thought, uh, so I better get it out now before I forget. Sure. But he mentioned early on in the conversation you guys were talking about the Big Bang. Right. Right. And you guys challenged him saying, Well, how do you know? How do you know? And he says, Well, no one saw it. We we you know, no one was there to see the Big Bang. But then he asks for evidence of creation, the account given in scripture. So it seemed like there was a little bit of a, a double standard there. That there were a lot of double standards. They were so numerous that I doubt I could remember them all. Because couldn't you just say, well, no one was there to see the creation account. What I mean, what do you want? Right, and that's sort of the point I made to him about faith. Um, but he wasn't having it. I mean, you know, I, I kind of, you know, as a person, I like Andy. I mean, I enjoy talking to him, um, and uh, I appreciated him. You know, he was he was interrupting me a lot at first, but I appreciated him calming down and, and letting me talk. Um, but um, but he really, I don't. He's not approaching it logically. I could tell that he had a lot of emotional reasons for trying to justify his denial of God. I found a much more rigorous case that he made emotionally than what it was. You know, because when I started getting him talking about prayer, I mean, that was pretty touching. I think. I mean, that talked to my emotional heartstrings a little bit because here's a guy, you know, and he's telling me about the pain in his life and everything. Um, you know, and I think that was, I think that was as far as him trying to make it. <laughs> You know, try and make, justify his his atheism, or, or I don't know if he even said he was atheist, but his skepticism of God. I think that was his best that was his best venue that he did was by just kind of telling us, sharing with us what he's experienced. And I wish we could have gone more into that, but the charge, but unfortunately, the subject changed back to the the evidential portion of of the discussion. But um, he was a lot more tactful on explaining his emotional reasons for not accepting God than he was his logical ones. So I'm I'm more inclined to believe that he's more of a case of like um. Oh, what's his name? He's he's insists he insists that um that William Lane Craig is avoiding him. Is it John? Is his first name? Uh, Anyways, he was a former student of Dr. Craig, and his and his when I read his book Why I'm an Atheist, me, all his emotional yeah. reasons came first, then followed by the intellectual yeah. one. And I'm he's inclined to believe that at the heart of it all, just as Romans one says, 
the um the reasons why he he rejects a, a Christianity and, and the triune God is one that's founded upon emotional reasons and not ones of logical reasons, and that's why we never had any support for any of his assertions throughout the entire discussion. Hmm. So that's what I got from him. Um, yeah. And that, <coughs> Go ahead. And you know, and, and that's why I talked to him about Job and Jesus Christ, because I want to point out that Jesus Christ suffered too. He's God in the flesh. And he suffered under the same thing that we go under. He suffered crucifixion, which is likely uh, worse than any kind of death we're ever going to experience. Um, and then Job's, you know, faith in God and how Job's faith, you know, we all look down, back at Job now for encouragement about and, and as an example of how one is supposed to handle trials and tribulations that are ordained by God. You know, so what happened with Job? Yes, it may have been, it may have seemed bad from a practical standpoint if you're taking a naturalistic approach, but. When you look at what 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 this what what happened, that Job actually accomplished, you can see why God ordained it so that Job could be an example for all of us, and that's what I was trying to point out to him. And then, um, but you know, but like I said, that I, it seems to me as I was telling um, Lynn that um, he fell he fell prey to a false gospel. It seemed like to me he fell prey to some sort of not maybe the the prosperity gospel that a lot of the people like uh, Benny Hinn espouse. Um, but some sort of variation of it, to where um, Christianity <laughs> guarantees that that your life is gonna is gonna be for the most part. Oh yeah, a, and practic it, it, a practicality, you know, practically good life, and that's just not what the Bible teaches. And what I find uh, coincidental, not really coincidental, but I just what I find to be the case uh, with people who hold those types of beliefs is strong emotionalism, and you guys pointed that out earlier. Right. Whenever you uh, like, th I would point out doctrinal issues with uh, fellow uh, professed believers. It, the most uh, upset emotional responses I get are from like charismatics who are it's right. all about mysticism, uh, and you know sometimes with Arminians you get a varied response there, and so I would expect no different from you know a different philosophic uh, starting point like the atheist position, that those who kind of have an emotional um, way of approaching the world will lash out more readily and not just kind of sit and think through what you had to say and like, oh, right. maybe. But um, with a with, uh, little response to what you just mentioned and what you guys were talking about, yeah, God, I think addressing the problem of evil and all the, the trials and tribulations and turmoil that people face in life, addressing that is <coughs> very important and uh, shouldn't just be pawned off to, oh, this is, you know, just we're in a fallen world and we, you know. Certainly, I'm... It's an emotional problem, not a logical one. The, the problem of evil that he presented was not the logical problem of evil. It's more of an emotional one. And that's why I tried to approach it with him. I wanted to meet him there um, because, you know, he's, a, he's human. He's not just some guy that I'm, you know, he's not a fake <coughs> robot voice that I'm arguing with. He's a real person. And right. he's sharing with me, the best of my knowledge, the experiences that he had. And, um, and I certainly didn't want to just wave them off. I think, you know, um, I care about, about the quality of his life. Um, and I wanted to show him that, you know, that, that there are, you know, basically the message of Romans 8.28, that all works are works for the glory of God for the greater good. Um, and um, he didn't get that, but that's what I was trying to get to him on. And I was trying to point out that Jesus, you know, that God suffered the same. You know, he suffered trials and tribulations while on this earth, and he never had to do it. Um, and I didn't think he would hear what I was saying as far as, like, he would, un he would, he would really get my point and take it to heart. But that was just, you know, that's how I approach when people make an emotional approach. I kind of approach them with my own emotional approach, just showing how, how God went through trials and tribulations too when he came down on earth and also point to Job about how Job reacted whenever he lost almost everything. Um, and that's usually the way I deal with those kind of objections. Have you gotten uh, the sort of response from other professing believers, though, that, you know, it's, it's kind of out of God's hands. It's not his fault. It's because we screwed up, and that's why we got all this bad stuff going on. You see... Um, I don't think that that's a salvation issue, but I don't think that that kind of response is consistent with what Scripture has to say. Scripture obviously teaches that God is sovereign and in control of everything. Um, and and when you look at when you look at the scriptures, like when you look at Ephesians one, or um, you know, um, or Romans chapter eight, or even some of the, the chapters in Hebrews, 
God ordains even the good and the bad. You can look like you can look back to where God hardened the Pharaoh's heart too. I mean, God is in control of it all. And even though things like, for instance, I had cancer when I was 24 years old, <coughs> and had of? I and if I did not have cancer, I would not be here today talking to you guys. I mean, I would not. I would you know I I would not be trying to, <coughs> to go out and evangelize or try and, and offend the faith or anything like that. I mean, God just opened my eyes in numerous ways using that experience. And while I thought it was the worst thing in the world that day that I found out I had cancer, um, I would do it all again because of, of what has come from it. And whenever you have someone with a finite mind, um, like any of us really, when you look into someone else's situation, we can't know what God's going to use that for. But we, but we have this one of the things you said, we can't, you're, you're like Christians, are afraid to have faith. I have faith that God is going to do exactly what he said in the Bible and use that for the greater good. Right, but he doesn't use it for the greater good of those whom are not his. And he could have done it other ways. Now, it might be particular to you and your experience with the, the cancer. You said you would not be talking to us today. Right. Uh, but for other people, they might still. Even, you know, different uh, personalities, all that sort of thing. Sure, you uh, can say with cancer, your results may vary. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but it's just for me. That's how he got me. But he gets everybody in different ways. You can look at the relationships that that the um, that the characters in the Bible have with God, and it's interesting to see some of the differences with the way they relate to God. Um, so, so what did that? How did that work out um, more specifically with you in your experience of having cancer? And, and what kind of cancer was it too? Oh sure, um, the cancer was B cell benign ocular melanoma, which basically <laughs> is a, a type of cancer that was not Eyeball. spreading. But it could spread eventually, and it was in my eye. It was in my iris. I had a spot in my eye, and um, it was really interesting the way it developed because I was living on my own, but I got this spot in my eye. My mom kept bothering me to go to the doctor, and I didn't think it was anything. I was only 24 years old, and she said it was only cancer, and I was like, yeah, right, and I blew it off. <clears throat> but it kept getting bigger, and then um, <clears throat> I got laid off from my job um, that I was working at, and at this time… I was working full time. I wasn't planning on going back to school um, for anything. I was just doing tech support over the phone in a call center, and I was happy with that mm -hmm. at the time. And I just said that's good enough for me. And I just and I just kind of stopped. Well, um, whenever I lost my job over there, you know, a bunch of people got laid off. I was one of them. And I um and I moved in, and I uh, this is a long story. I hope you don't mind. But um, I but I went to live. I had to go live with my parents again. I was about. Um, 24 years old when that happened, and then shortly after I moved back in, um, about three months after I moved back in, I found out I had cancer. I went to the eye doctor, and, and um, at, at my mom's instructions, because she she basically had to she made she called and made the appointment for me because I was too lazy to do it. I didn't really want to do anything. I was just kind of just surfing the internet all day. Um, and then um, I went to the doctor, and, he, and then I was told by by the doctor that I had cancer, and I had to go to um, well, he said I possibly could have cancer. It was likely, but he didn't know for sure. I had to go to Birmingham, Alabama to find out. So I went to UAB, and, the, and what's funny is they scheduled me with the, with the wrong doctor initially. And um, my, my dad did some inquiring over there, um, and he found out that, they, that I needed to go to a different doctor for what they were sending me to. So my appointment got moved up to see a doctor named Dr. Callahan, who, um, he, was a, he was a Christian, a missionary, and a, and a creationist. Um, and he's, a, he's one of the number one eye surgeons in the country. And I ended up with him, and he actually did an incision on my eye and cut the cancer out of my eye. And even after all that, I have 20-20 vision. And I was sitting in the waiting room before the first time I was going to see Dr. Callahan. And I was, and I was reading a book because whenever I had cancer, then I had cancer, I started looking for the answers to my questions, such as does God exist, which religion is really true, can I really know if any religion is true. And I was reading this um, this book called Creation and Astronomy by Dr. Donald A. Young. And then I had this thought that dawned on me that um, that basically, uh, you know, I am 24 years old and I am facing my mortality. But what about all those other people out there that are facing their mortality and they don't know the truth of the gospel? And that, just, that weighed on me very heavily. And as a result, I started talking to atheists more and I started debating atheists too. And I, and I started studying philosophy and theology, um, reading my Bible more. And I, um, ended up at, you know, I ended up becoming an apologist. And after, uh, about after a little bit less, about, about maybe a little bit over a year or so, I don't remember the exact timeline, I decided to start a website, um, and I called it Answers for Hope. It was originally at AnswersForHope.com. Now we're at AnswersForHope.org. 
Um, but I started this website, and I have gotten so many emails in, and um, and I'm about to put some of them on the site about people who have come to the website and and just they felt blessed by it. And I've also gotten emails from people that were previously unbelievers, and then they said that my 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 website helped um, help them um, you know get introduced to Christ, and they ended up becoming Christians later on. Um, so God has done a wonderful work in, in the suffering that I had temporarily with cancer. Um, and I still have 20/20 vision. I just got this weird spot in my in my right eye. That's all. I, <laughs> that's that's all that's left of the cancer. Um, so really, in my in that's how God brought me to Him was through was through that ordeal. And and I would you know and I would happily do it again for what for what I have gained from um, having that experience. So that's that's a summary of my story. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Yeah, you're unmuted. Okay, I unmuted it for a second. Yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty interesting. You brought up like how people, they don't see their mortality and therefore they don't really consider these things. Right. Um, when we don't know when we're going to die, a lot of times we think of um, terminality when you're like 80, 90 years old or when you get diagnosed with some serious disease. Right. Uh, but if someone is going to die in their 20s, like say 25, and when it happens 20, all the time. Right. When they're 24, they're really old, even though they're not by our, you know, common right. standard. Because you, you gauge age by how long something is going to last. When a, when a hose on your dryer expires after, you know, five years, when it's four, it's old. Right. So I, I think it is, uh, you know, something that people shouldn't toy around with, you know, thinking about your mortality it could happen any time. Right. For so, sure. but anyways, though, I just I just thought the most productive part of the discussion was when we were talking to to and to um to Andy about about his experience and why <laughs> he's you know with prayer and everything. I think that was the most fruitful part of the discussion. Oh yeah, really, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, because it really got us into a, a biblical <laughs> discussion about how God can use um, apparent pain and suffering for the greater good. Um, you know, well, and, and it's not really for our greater good, it's for his greater good, because as it was said many times by Lynn and by Tim, this is all about God, it's not about us. I mean, you, you, the, the, the Bible is not, if you want to, if you want to make it a re religion that people would buy into, you don't, you make a religion that's human-centered. Go look at, um, at people like Joel Osteen, who has a, has the biggest, one of the biggest congregations in America, and he's preaching health, wealth, and prosperity, and not the actual gospel. And he is filthy rich. I mean, if you want to get, if you want to attract people to your religion, focus on the human nature, and not on God's nature. If you focus on God's nature, you're not going to have very many fans. And it's amazing that the Bible is got centered in on God, and you see how Christianity is, um, you know, um, the world, you know, basically the world's biggest religion. Um, Plus, it helps if you, if you have. Um, it always helps to have gleaming white horse teeth too. I noticed that with the Tim or with the guy Tony Robbins. Joel Osteen's another one. So if you got that, you you can sell some. Some. Oh yeah, pulse. they got a smile. That's for sure. <laughs> um, sparkle comes up. No, but with prayer, um, that was uh, uh, that verse he brought up. Something that was directed towards four? Christians. John six, yeah. So that was not even talking to the unbeliever. I think you brought up a verse in Matthew chapter Matthew chapter four too. Um, and and, e and even with the believer, once you've already gotten into that category, believers only now. Even within that category, you got certain criteria, certain things where God will shun His ear to you, like selfishness, <coughs> others, <coughs> specific sins like idolatry, stinginess, unforgiveness, yeah. spousal. Disunity. I'm reading this from my little um, outline I did on prayer a long time ago. Without getting into the details, um, I can give the citations if you want. Unbelief uh, would be for that category <laughs> that he's in. James 1, 5 through 7 uh, will deal with that. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. Not doubting. That's the one he brought up, James, right? Yeah, um, and I brought up a passage of James too that says that God, you know, basically that um, that um, you know, 
not all prayers will be, be answered the way you want them to. I mean, you know, James clearly says that you don't receive because you ask wrongly, and I brought that up to him, but he didn't seem to, to respond to it. Um, but we got to look at the verses um, as a whole. we got to look at the Bible as an entire book and not, not one of just comprised of individual verses. <laughs> and I think that's what he was doing. Yeah, was yeah, at exactly. But, um, Lynn, you've been pretty What's quiet. You got anything to say in all this? <laughs> um... You know, I I, uh, I had a lot to say about it. You know, the <laughs> with regard to prayer, even even from the aspect of the believer, saying a prayer and asking for something in prayer is not a guarantee that that prayer is going to be answered exactly the way you want it to be answered. Absolutely. You know, I mean, look, God knows the end from the beginning, and some people would ask, well, as a as a Calvinist or a Christian or whatever, why would you pray if God already knows the end from the beginning? And by the way, even the Arminian who believes in God's perfect foreknowledge would have the same issue because if God knows the end of, from the beginning and God does not change his mind, then why pray? Well, because prayer changes us. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't guarantee a change in, in the outcome that God has foreordained before the foundation of the world. So to just... You know, to just say, well, God didn't answer my prayer, therefore God doesn't exist. Well, you know, it's this, it's this man-centered that gospel that says that God did all of this for us, right? Right. That, that, that this is, it's all about us, and it's not. And this is why Reformed theology, it's so important to not just, you know, it, it's got to be preached. Because this is all about God. It's not about us. Everything right. is made by him, for him, and through him. Okay, and even so, the heavens were made for God. I mean, not for us. A lot of people think the earth was made just for us. Not so. I see what it's happening. Right. You know, we had an atheist in a hangout earlier. I think it was that unworshipped deity who said, you know, why would God make all this <laughs> universe just for us? You know, the, you know, basically saying, like, there should be... You know, why isn't there life on other planets? Well, he didn't make it all for us. He made it for his glory. Right. You know, it's not for us. It's not about us. You know, read Psalm 19, Psalm 104. Um, you know, God, God is concerned with nothing more than his own glory. Right. Nothing more. But people have this, uh, this false, you know, this false idea about the gospel that it's all about us. And it, it is to a degree. I mean, you know, when you look at Second Corinthians, uh, what is it? Second Corinthians five seventeen or five twenty one. That for our sake, so that's that's what he did for us. But again, who is Paul writing that letter to? Right. The church. That letter is being written to a church of believers. Absolutely. So we we preach and we have these conversations because we don't know who the elect are. We don't know who God is saving, um, and we're commanded to, you know, go and preach the gospel to all nations. Absolutely. And and you know, furthermore, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was hell. You know, he was clearly either an annihilationist or a universalist or both. Um, you know. And when you have that worldview, hell does seem utterly unreasonable. When you have a man-centered gospel, if, right. look, if, if we're all God's children, why would he make hell to send us there? Well, again, <laughs> it's not about us. God did this for his glory. And hell is reasonable because we have sinned against him. You know, you look at, um, you look at um, David's prayer in, in Psalm 51, Against you and you alone have I sinned, O oh God. You know, I mean, he was lamenting his—he was lamenting his sin against God. Right. Um. And 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 that's what makes hell reasonable because because um, the law is the perfect re reflection of all of God's attributes, or not all of God's attributes, but it's a perfect reflection of His attributes, His justice, His mercy, His grace, etc. The law is a perfect reflection of those, and so, and we're made in His image, and as image bearers of of God, we are His representatives, and so when we sin, when we sin against God, 
we're not just sinning against God, but we're giving a testimony to all of creation and saying something about God because we're made in his image. And that's why sin is so offensive to him. Is because we're not just we're not just saying something about ourselves, we're saying something about him also. Right. Oh that hurts. You know, but um people people just have this this utterly man centered, you know, well, <laughs> We're all God's children, and God loves everybody. God is omnibenevolent, this, this thing that God is all loving. No, he's not. Scripture says quite the contrary. Um, and again, it's like I said to Andy, well, love. why does love have to mean the same thing in every single context? You know, I love my children far differently than I love Tom's children. You know, I love my wife far differently than I love you. To, you know what I mean? There are different degrees, different kinds of love. And we understand that as people, but somehow we can't manage to put to um, give God the same categories that we allow for ourselves. It's ridiculous. Right. Well, I think it, it might be a little bit different than that because although if we try to put ourselves in God's shoes, which is virtually impossible, um... We try to imagine, okay, we're the owners of something that we made. We can do whatever we want with it, but we wouldn't put it in hell forever. So I can understand that. It sounds unreasonable, even to the fleshly part of my being. You know, we're getting down to metaphysics here. Uh, that exists, I, I think it's unreasonable, but it doesn't matter what I think. Um, right. It is my conclusion. It doesn't matter. I think what Cornelius, or what's his name? Yukon Cornelius. Cornelius has to say is very important on this subject. You remember that guy? <laughs> yeah, from the Rudolph. The Rudolph. Yeah. Right, right. So, that, I mean. But that's the I thing is we, yeah. we we don't even find it reasonable at points and and this is a point of faith for us because we don't have a full understanding of God's justice. You know, even even by what he's revealed to us in his word, we don't have a full understanding of his justice. You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, we're not on mission, so we can't, you know. That's that's the one attribute I think that a lot of people, when they're criticizing God about letting bad things happen to people, God is omniscient. He knows every aspect of reality and what every cause and effect is going to lead to. And God said himself he's going to work into his glory. So by default, you know, whenever you, when you're talking about, you know, evil and suffering isn't compatible with, it's not incompatible with Christianity in the slightest. I mean, we look at Genesis chapter 3, we see that if Christianity is true, we would expect evil and suffering in the world. Um, and that's exactly what we find. And I think we'd have a bigger problem if, if the Bible said that we had evil and suffering in the world and there wasn't any evil and suffering. I think we'd have a bigger problem, um, you know, adjusting for our, justifying our faith in that instance and defending it. Um, but, um, you know, but God is omniscient, so he knows the cause and effect of every, you know, every possible action. And, and, that, and through God's omniscience, and his and his knowledge and of reality and, and and what the causes and effects of his actions will be. I mean, God just God just works his way and he does it through you know. I believe he does it through um through man. You know, he, you know. I I guess you could say I accept compatibilism, which says that God works his will through through men. Um, you know, kind of like how he did with the Pharaoh. Um, but I just don't see the problem of evil and suffering. Why it might be a problem for a general theistic God or maybe the prosperity gospel God or um. Or the uh, you know or, or universalist God, I can see why that would be a problem, but not for the Christian God that's that's um, in the Bible. I mean, evil and suffering is something we should expect if Christianity is true, and the concept of being able to discern between what's evil and what's not is also something we'd expect in the Christian worldview, and not one of the reprobates. So.